Hey everyone, thanks for joining and I apologize for the delayed start. We're just gonna wait a few more seconds to let everyone in and then we'll get started. Okay, um, I'm Judy, I'm the Executive Director of FEAST and thank you all so much for joining us for today's webinar. I'm um, just gonna you. ask you to make sure right, that thank you. your um, good timing, please make sure that your microphone is off and also that your camera is off um, and make sure that they both remain off during the duration of the webinar, um, at least for the presentation part. And we're gonna try something new today that we haven't done before. Usually we ask you to put your chat questions, sorry, ask you to put your questions in the chat feature. Um, but today we're gonna try something a little bit different. Um, if you have a question when Abby is finished presenting, then you can um, take your video and put it back on, but keep yourself muted, please. And raise your hand in Zoom, um, not for real, in Zoom. And I will see your hand raised and I will call on you and you can then unmute yourself and ask Abby your question and then mute afterwards. So we're trying to make it a little more interactive and personal um, and so that Abby can actually see you and hear you when you ask your questions. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our presenter. Abby Sarat Cooper is a licensed professional counselor and certified eating disorder specialist. Her postgraduate education includes training and certification in family-based treatment, FBT, for pediatric eating disorders and intensive training in dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT, by the developers of both the standard model and DBT-A for adolescents, which incorporates family involvement as well as training in applying DBT to couples, families, and eating disorders by leading researchers in those areas. Abby was on the faculty at a local university where for 10 years, she taught courses in child development and adolescent development. She's been in private practice for 18 years where her focus has been on evidence-based evidence -based and health at every size informed practice for eating disorders and strengthening family communications and understanding. This combination of grounding in developmental science along with clinical experience has allowed Abby to help families navigate the differences between typical development concerns and pathological issues that need intervention. Of course, that means using methods that work. Therefore, Abby was an early adopter of integrating DBT and FBT to both empower families and manage the intense dysregulation that is regularly seen in the FBT process. Throughout her career, Abby has been a passionate advocate in schools, the community at large, and the media for evidence-based treatment that is non-judgmental, stigma-reducing, and myth-busting. She is a member of the Academy for Eating Disorders and the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. It is our pleasure to have you with us today, Abby. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Judy, for inviting me to give this presentation. You know, um, that was a lot of words about me, which is a little embarrassing when I really want to focus on everyone else um, and, and the work, right? This is my passion. FBT is my passion, DBT is my passion. And um, so I wanna start out with something that might seem a little silly. Uh, by the way, we had a little bit of a technology glitch. So I'm gonna be a little bit distracted trying to bring up my screen while you're looking at a slightly different thing. So I apologize for that. But I want you to do something for me right now. I want you to not think about pink elephants. Really, stop thinking about pink elephants. How's that going? How's the not thinking going? Usually people tell me not so well. So let's try something else. I want you to bring to mind a scene. This time I'm asking you to think about something. A very, very challenging scene from the treatment of your loved one at home. I want you to go back to an experience that was incredibly distressing. The most challenging scene you can recall. I want you to use all of your senses. I want you to evoke all kinds of details about the smells, the quality of the air in the room, who was there, what kind of things did you hear? Maybe what were your thoughts? What were your feelings? and see if it brings you back to what your body felt like and what it was really like in that moment. 
Now, I want you to notice your body right now in this space and what it feels like. Forward the slide. So I am imagining that what I did was evoke something that set off your internal alarm system, that sent you back to a time when you were highly dysregulated and things were very intense and maybe very much out of control. And that has all of us invested in it, our thoughts, our feelings, and our bodies. Now, let's try something else. So we're gonna forward the slide again. And I want you to think about something that's more in your comfort zone. Maybe it's what some people might call their happy space. Maybe it's a place you've been on a vacation to, or maybe it's a place that you fantasize about going on vacation to. Maybe it's right at home, right? When things are peaceful and calm and you might be sitting comfortably with a book, with your family around, you might be knitting or doing some other hobby. You might be sitting with pets. I want you to really evoke that once again trying to pull up sights, smells, tastes, right? any kind of sensory data that's gonna fully evoke that experience for you. Now I want you to notice the difference in your body right now from just a few minutes ago. I'm imagining there's a difference, but I wanna ask you one other question. I bet you forgot about the pink elephants. That is the power of our mind and our thoughts. So one of the things I wanna be clear about is that I am not here today to give you the answer for how to make sure that there are never any more intense scenes at home or on the road to ED recovery. I don't have that answer. I am here to offer you some options, some processes, some skills based in DBT. And as I've used them and as uh, other people around the country are also using them to help families. Now, some of the skills we already just used. And these can get you through some of the toughest, most intense experiences you may ever have. And our work today is applying these principles and skills to yourself. We're not focusing on your loved one. Ultimately, yes, that's what we wanna be able to do. We wanna bring these skills from you into your family and then maybe even through modeling them as well as teaching them to a loved one, we can improve the overall situation. So let's advance the slide again. So I want you to notice from before, just a few moments ago, how powerful our minds are, that our thoughts have power. Now I'm not talking about hokey folky, you know, positive thinking fluff stuff here. I'm talking about very realistic use of our brains and cognitive processes. Realistic meaning based in science, okay? And even with that, there is no perfect skill, just like there's no perfect parent. Some of the skills that I teach work for some people, some of the time. Sometimes me or you as imperfect humans are going to make mistakes, and that is what it is. So if we can accept that there's no such thing as perfect, then we can give ourselves and our loved ones the benefit of the doubt and truly accept that each one of us is really doing the best they can in the moment. Now, we're not saying it's the best they'll ever be able to do or that will ever be able to do. I always think of Maya Angelou's quote that when we know better, we do better. But in the moment that we find ourselves, we're doing the best we can. So why does this giving the benef 
instead of the doubt matter. It matters because to do otherwise is ineffective and our goal is to be as effective as possible. So to be ineffective means allowing the experience around us to set off a chain of internal events. Slide forward, please. So DBT recognizes that all of our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are linked. A chain, series of dominoes, whatever image helps you bring that to mind. And we start one place and we often end up at quite another spot with a behavior that we really didn't want to act on. We call that in DBT, we call it a target behavior. And in our case, we might look at it as, at it as screaming, becoming aggressive. So that's our target behavior. How does it work that these things are linked? Well, every thought has an emotional response. Emotions, in turn, have behavioral urges. Let me give you an example that's way far away from eating disorders. Let's, anybody here ever have road rage? I'm thinking of some incidents where I've been on a road and someone has cut me off going really over the speed limit. And I'm thinking, that jerk, how dare they? And we speed up. That's why I can't get this. And we get to the stoplight and we are really pissed and we want to give them the finger. Throw, right? The action urge. The thought, that jerk. Right? We got angry and we had a behavior. Now let's say, can you advance the slides, please? Let's say we want to break the chain, and we do. And in the example I just gave with the road rage, we look over into that car. Now we see somebody in the passenger seat that's 10 months pregnant. Now what do we think? Right? We think something very differently, and now our emotions soften. Right? Now the light turns green, and we're like brushing them on. Go, go, go. Get ahead of me. Right? Changed everything. So all it takes is coming in to this chain at thoughts, emotions, or actions, any place in the chain, to change it all. So we're going to start at the place that DBT considers to be the beginning of all chains. So if we can advance the slide. DBT always starts with our vulnerability factors. All of us sitting in this space together have vulnerabilities in our lives right now. They can be long-term, they can be recent, right? These are contextual factors of our life. And they leave us depleted, run down, and therefore vulnerable to being at the mercy of those dominoes falling. We are not our strongest selves. So we are vulnerable to the thoughts and the feelings and the action urge spirals and resorting to those aggressive behaviors that we don't wanna have. So if our goal is really to de-escalate and not resort to aggression, right? We have to start with our vulnerabilities. So typical vulnerability factors in our situation of having a loved one with an eating disorder, heck, we are, living with a child with a life-threatening illness. If that's not a huge vulnerability, then nothing is, right? This may also include sleep deprivation. This may include isolation from friends and family. This may actually be about chronicity if this has been going on for an extended period of time, right? The longer something goes on, the more vulnerable we can become. But we're also vulnerable to our own thought habits. So let's advance one more time. So if the stage is set by our vulnerabilities and then a prompting event occurs, which can be anything internal 
or external that starts the dominoes going down the chain and results in that target behavior. So maybe that's a refusal to start a meal. I'm sure everybody here has had this experience. Now, the thought habit that could be a significant link is something like he or she is being a brat. They are disrespectful. I'm failing. I can't do this anymore. We can't do this for the rest of our lives. Right? These are all understandable thoughts, but they become significant links because they set off our dysregulation. Another big DBT word, right? We have an emotional reaction. And that aligns with the thought, right? Those thoughts evoke fear, anger, despair. And those things trigger our fight or flight response. So this is biology, right? And our fight or flight response sets off an action urge, right? We either want to fight, come in, or run away, avoid. And that is a non-dialectical pattern. So if we could go forward one more time. So that fight or flight, black and white pattern, grabs us. And how do we release it? We breathe. Now, I hate saying that because I feel like everybody just rolled their collective eyes. It sounds like so trite, like such a cliche. But I want to tell you why it's not. So we just talked about a biological relationship between thoughts, emotions, and actions set off by our fight or flight, right? Our autonomic nervous system. So we can break into that system through our breath. If you remember the horror scene that we set up at the beginning, you may have had a speedier heart rate. Your breathing might have gotten faster. Those are signs to our body that, oh no, we have to be on red alert. So by definition, if we are breathing slowly and steadily, the coast is clear as far as our body's concerned. Everything comes back down. And what happens is the brain is it releases. We have more flexibility. We have more problem solving skills. So breathing is not just a cliche. It's actually a very significant, impactful and effective tool of DBT. So if we can advance. So I wanna go back to this fight or flight response and the idea of non-dialectical thinking because it's something we teach in DBT with families where there's an eating disorder, where there's not an eating disorder. And it's all about all or nothing thinking, black or white thinking. And most of us are aware that anorexia has a lot of black and white thinking. So that's gonna be in our loved one. It's gonna be in the room. It may even be in the family. So to notice this kind of either or, right, wrong, absolute, someone must, someone can't, someone should, some shouldn't, these kind of judgments are all non-dialectical. Okay? So we want to go from a non-dialectical set to a dialectical set. And if you could advance the slide. Right. So dialectical thinking is about finding a synthesis between what appear to be opposing forces. We're looking for the both and, not the either or. The idea that your child can either start eating immediately and finish everything, or this meal is failure, is false. Except in a zero sum game of right, wrong, right? Success, failure. And there are in fact many, many options when we give up on judgments of self, right, of others, that can begin with just having one bite, right? And just one more bite. Maybe we've all heard that expression. And this is why, right? We wanna open up possibilities. We can advance the slide. 
So dialectical thinking in DBT is about creating space for physiological stepping back. That's the breath. Emotionally stepping back through self-validation, through validation of a loved one. Right? Cognitively stepping back from black and white thinking. Where else can we step back? Well, we can step back from lower priority responsibilities, maybe. We can let go of other shoulds or judgments about what we are not doing while we are attending to our loved one, while we're doing all this caretaking, while we're doing the important work or saving somebody's life. We can look at problem solving from a wider lens. Okay? After doing the best that we can to think dialectically and re-regulate our emotions and turning our thoughts and releasing judgments, we can also step back from seeing ourselves as the source of all solutions. Advance, please. So the idea is, is that we all live in a network of concentric circles. And we were just talking about ourselves at the center of the circle. And what I was just saying is to step back from being the only source of solution and to extend our problem solving outward, right? What have you or haven't you shared with family and close friends about the battle with the ED? Okay. Thinking about immediate family, extended family, friends. If they do not know your pain, they cannot support you. If they cannot support you, and they cannot support your child. Families often raise the common concern, the concern that like support is gonna come then at an expense of shame or embarrassment. And I think what is missing from the equation is the awareness that our fear, right, of feelings may actually be preventing us from reaching out and finding out that our worst fears aren't gonna come true, that we're not gonna be shamed, we're not gonna be embarrassed, we're gonna get the actual help that we need. It's a possibility. So even for people who don't reveal everything, we can still ask for errands to be run by a family member or a friend. Maybe even someone can come for dinner because we know the eating disorder will not rear its head as intensely if there's someone who's not in the immediate household in the room. Okay. So, advance to the next slide, please. So beyond the people that immediately come to mind, there are potential others. Maybe people in a religious community, um, fraternal communities. I have a friend that's a Mason and they show up for each other, just like people in religious communities do. Most religious communities have a caring committee of some kind who can show up and provide support and assistance, practical, emotional. Okay. Relying on community is a very difficult thing to do. But I wonder how many of you have actually been a person who has shown up in community for others. And so why is it so much easier to show up for others than to ask others to show up for us? And I'd be remiss if I didn't call attention to the feast community where everybody shows up for each other, where people who have walked this very hard road turn around and help pull other people up the road. It happens in other places as well. So let's keep extending our network outward. If we can go on to the next slide. So there may come a point despite all the stepping back and all the skills and all the re-regulating, that we have to turn to community professional helpers. Here we've gotten used to calling them first responders, right? And it is extremely important to identify who the first responders are in your community and what their roles are. When I start with a family, I often ask them to call or go to 
their local law enforcement office. Maybe it's a police station and ask who are the first responders in the community for a mental health emergency. I urge families to explain their recovery from an eating disorder, like what it looks like and what malnourishment does to the brain, right? In terms of heightened anxiety, depression and behavioral reactivity. To further explain that it is not uncommon for these behaviors to rise to the level of aggression or violence. Explain that your family is working with healthcare professionals who have instructed you to supervise your child's every meal and prevent further starvation and promote recovery. This might seem like an extreme step to take, yet EDs are known to resort to extreme behaviors. Therefore, protecting your child and your family in this way is a necessary precaution, potentially. One extreme outcome that we wanna prevent at all costs is the potential for a parent to be identified as the cause of escalation and aggression. Even if a parent is reacting to a child's behavior, I once worked with a family who I begged to do this process and they refused in terms of contacting their local first responders. And at one point their child actually threw a lamp and there was broken glass everywhere. And the father grabbed the daughter to get her out of the glass and it left a bruise on her arm. So what I'm talking about has happened in so many instances that I can name. So it is super important to, to kind of make a preemptive strike in connecting to these first responders. We don't want a parent to be identified as the problem because you and I know here that we're the source of the solution much of the time. So I want to go forward a slide. And I wanna introduce the idea of a safety script. So while we're going outside the home and we're kind of preparing for who can be called on, another first step is having a safety script like the one here, ready, not to be yelled or threatened. In fact, it's more of a mindful step in the process of de-escalation. Because as we say this, we calm ourselves as we potentially calm a loved one, right? We're saying this is a safe place. I won't let anyone hurt you, throw things at you, and I can't let you hurt me, your sibling, throw things, because this is a safe place. And I will call for help to make sure this is a safe place. Notice how many times safe place was repeated, right? So sometimes just the eating disorder, knowing that a parent is prepared to take action like this can change behavior, right? Just the statement, sometimes not. Sometimes it's reaching for the phone. Sometimes it's the actual call. And sometimes it's the need to actually have professionals show up. Now, there is somebody here with me today that I wanted to introduce. Maud is a mom that I know who um, in her incredible work, helping her daughter recover from an eating disorder, ended up using these kind of resources. And I was hoping Maud could turn on her camera and her um, mic and would be able to talk a little bit about what this particular part of FBT treatment was like, calling on first responders, and what it may have um, changed, and how her use of that affected her and her family. Can you hear me, Abby? I can hear you. I'm hitting start video. Do I need to hit the start video? Yep. It's saying that my host has disabled it. Oh. <laughs> so maybe that's something they can do. So I have myself unmuted, but every time, okay, ask you to start. Okay. There you go. You're there. Here. <laughs> okay. 
Can so you- basically what happened in those early stages and how you had to call for help? Yeah, I, uh, I had to call for help a couple of times and it got so, the rage got so outrageous and so scary and scary to herself and scary for us that she was just in danger. And I, I had mentioned having to call 911 because I couldn't watch her suffer. And she, she need, it need, we needed the help at that moment and I, I said it a few times, but those the two times that I got to the point of actually following her after not eating a meal with the phone in my hand, having to call 911, I said, I'm calling 911, you are a danger, you, you are, we are in a scare, very scary situation. She told me she was never gonna speak to me again for the rest of my life. She hopes I die. She was screaming, she was hurting herself, pulling her hair, punching, running, screaming, it was, the worst experience. And I did, I called 911 while running through the streets and I, and it was a very scary moment. It, it, but it calmed us all ultimately down in the front yard of the neighbors down the street when the police showed up and I was the screaming mom on the other end of the phone um, saying my daughter has anorexia and she won't eat. And this is what I need to get her to eat. And I need your help. I need somebody here. And ultimately the ambulance came. She decided to get in the ambulance and go to the hospital. And we drove behind her in the car. She didn't wanna be with me at that point. And um, she didn't talk to me for a few more hours after that, but that was the first experience with calling 911. And the second experience was driving in the car. I had my couple of booths in hand because she needed to eat and, and she wasn't gonna do anything. The world stopped until you, you finish this boost. And I had a couple up with me and she dumped them all over the car. I had the doors locked. I said, I'm driving to the hospital and I'm going to call 911 if you don't. And I just, just kept myself as calm as possible while she was freaking, freaking, freaking out. And we ultimately pulled into the hospital. I said, I'm calling 911. And I did. And the police showed up. I explained to the officer my problem and they were just amazing. And it just you know, brought everything back into, into perspective. And she realized that I was not going to let this happen to her. And I was not gonna watch her go through this and suffer. And she needed the help at that moment. And it was the best thing that I followed through with. <laughs> Maud? Yeah. The answer to this, but I just want you to tell everybody else, your daughter, did she ever not, did she really not speak to you again? No, we, we are a very, very close mother and daughter. <laughs> very, exactly. and uh, yeah, she was talking to me a few hours later. Exactly, yeah. And, and maybe share with everybody the biggest irony of all about what you now do. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't work for a while going through this, you know, home with her 24 seven, the meal, re- weight restoration. Um, I now, work I'm a radio operator for 911 for my my local county and I answer 911 calls <laughs> and I can't imagine anyone better to do it how, yeah it's how amazing that you know what it's like to be that desperate parent on the other end of the line yeah and to be yeah. able to show your amazing empathy yeah it's 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 crazy I never imagined doing that when I was working and doing all this with her and everything that we were going through and getting her life back and helping her get her life back, getting those meals in her. And I was not going to let Ed win. I was not going to let him beat her up and beat us up. And I just needed her safe. And that I would have gone to the ends of the world to- Mom, I have watched you, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have watched you learn these skills, learn how to ground yourself. Are there any clues, cues you can maybe share with anyone about that process for you? Like you talked about breathing. I would have to definitely find myself just stepping away for a moment and just taking a deep breath in the midst of this chaos, food everywhere, bruises, her bruises, my bruises, the fights, the screaming. Um, I would just have to take a moment and just take a breath 
and keep myself calm and tell myself that I have to stay calm. Otherwise I would have probably wanted to kick a wall um, and, and join her in, in craziness or out in the surf, the crazy surf. But I had to take a step back and just keep myself calm so that I could try to get her calm or I just wouldn't say anything sometimes. I just would stay silent. I would stop talking. And right. then when I finally calmed down, a lot of times I just gave her a huge hug and just hugged her and just reminded her how much I loved her and that we're always there for her and just reminded her no matter how crazy it got and painful to her and us, we're just here for you and how much we love her and we're going to do whatever it takes to help her get through it and Thank keep, you. keep feeding her. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Maud. It's been a gift to have you willing to share this with everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Happy. So I am hoping that some of what we covered today is useful. Um, I am happy to send my slides to anybody who wants them, right? If they want to remember something I said and they, and they don't have it, you know, they didn't feel they could hold on to it. Um, there are lots of resources out there for learning DBT and learning DBT skills and finding ways to ground oneself. And it is absolutely not trivial. It is absolutely not hokey. There is a biological basis. This is an evidence-based model of treatment that's really effective. And remember what I said, there's no perfect. So not everything is gonna work all of the time. And sometimes nothing's gonna work. And then it's a matter of just getting through it to the other side till next time. So I wanted to make sure I left enough time for questions. So that's where we're at. Um, well, sorry, one second. Let me just get my video back. <clears throat> um, so first of all, thank you. Um, you know, thank you, Abby, and <clears throat> thank you, Maude. Um, you know, retelling your story, um, you know, as a parent, having been, you know, not in that uh, severe of a situation, but certainly, you know, familiar with the aggression that comes during mealtimes from our kids, um, it can't be easy to go back to that place, even just for a few minutes. Um, but you did it to help other parents and I really appreciate it. So thank you very much for that willingness. Um, I see that we have one question so far, which I will take. Um, Heidi, you can turn on your video and um, also your mic. And just a reminder, if you have questions, then just raise your hand and I will get to you. So Heidi, I don't see you there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. You and Abby. Abby, I really, really appreciate your presentation. Uh, my question would be if the recording as, as well as the sliding will be available after the presentation. I'll be more than happy to put my email in the chat. But um, I wanted to thank you, Abby, for explaining uh, these skills in a, such a, an easy and effective way. Um, I have tried them all, and as you mentioned, um, not all of them work every time. Sometimes they don't work, but it, what you said to conclude the presentation, it may be just the opportunity to get to the next time. So if at least we can stop it now, there will be a next time. And this is just putting one foot in front of the other. Um, I really like it, and thank you so much for doing this for this community. Which, by the way, the skills not only help us among the ED sufferers and the families, they are very good for everything else in life. And they are very spiritual oriented. If we think about it, there is a connection between spirituality and, and the, um, putting these skills to work. It helps us and it helps others. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. That felt um, more yeah. a compliment and an overview than any question. Um, I just did want to say that the recordings for all of our webinars are available on the FEAST website. 
it usually takes us a few days to get them online, but definitely by the beginning of next week, um, you know, they'll be there. And definitely also, you know, if you know somebody who wasn't here, um, but that can use, you know, the, the important skills that Abby taught today and the experience that Maude shared, please let them know. They can go to the FEAST website and they can take a look at the video. Um, Lily, I see that your hand is up. You're next. Yeah, hi. Um, Abby, thank you. And Maud, thank you so much for your uh, bravery. So I'm actually a FBT therapist. And so it was really helpful to hear um, a lot of this from you, Abby. But my question is, just knowing obviously that you do FBT, do you introduce a lot of these skills just regularly at the beginning? Like it was surprising to me that you mentioned you kind of talked through like going to the first responders and in a sense like normalizing that. And I'm, I'm just curious how you like practically um, discuss these skills with families. Like, do you do that on the front end or do you kind of do that as needed? Just what's your approach? So when I work with families, I incorporate it all along and sometimes I'm not labeling it as a DBT skill, yeah. right? I see it as part of my worldview at this point in time. So for me, it'll, it'll, just come out as we're going through an interaction that happened during the week, mm -hmm. right? And, and what was your thought? Like I'm doing chains, like I'm a DBT therapist in the same moment I'm an FBT therapist. And so I'm doing the chain and I've got that laid out in my head and I'm helping a parent see their own chain. Ah, oh, and so that thought really set you off, didn't it? Wow, of course it did. Now, what can we, right? Like I'm doing it as we're going. So you, you really just integrate it into the session, really, in terms of, I'm especially in a lot of phase one, like, how is the re-nourishment going? Um, and yeah. maybe not labeling it as a separate thing, but just basically embedding the tools right in the... Right. Now, as we know, you know, FBT is a staged-based treatment. And so as we go through, a lot of things resolve, right? Anxiety can reduce, depression can reduce, but we can see that for some young people, there may be still needs to be addressed, right? And at that point, we may refer somebody for DBT therapy, a more traditional. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, thank you. It was really, really helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, Mindy, I see your hands up. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you so much for this. I feel really emotional after listening to all that, just because um, um, I have a 14 year old with anorexia and um, we have had to call the police once. And uh, I just never imagined in my life um, that we would ever end up in that spot. So, you know, of course, dealing with all the shame and all those things. So it's emotional to listen, but also helpful to know that, okay, um, this is often a part of the process. Um, but I guess my question is, it seems like my daughter is, I don't, I don't know when you actually finish weight. She's weight restored. She's at her goal weight. Um, but um, we're just kind of beginning to start dealing with kind of what goes on inside of her and her thought process and stuff like that. And she seems to be on about a two week cycle where she just regulates about every two weeks. Um, we get through a couple of weeks, she does really well. And then it seems like every other Friday, it seems often on a Friday, she enters this real fight or flight place. And the question I have is often like we work really hard. We, we learned she was impatient for a while and we learned a lot of tools as far as like her expressing where she's at in her regulation. So she's a green light, she's a yellow light, she's a red light. And we work really hard to keep her out of red. I mean, it is like a full-time job to keep her out of red sometimes, but we work really hard on it. But if she goes to red, it seems like none of the tools that I have to help her work. And it's funny because she will run away sometimes. I think she's ran away four times now. Um, she comes back always so far, but, um, but I think when we discuss afterwards, when she's regulated, okay, what do you think would have helped? Like everything she tells us is going to help her when we try it, it doesn't help her. <laughs> so like, will like, she'll say, I want you to chase after me. Like when I walk away and you don't chase after me, I feel like you don't want me. So I'm like, okay. So then we chase after her and then she fights us the whole time we're chasing after her and it escalates work. It gets worse because we struggle then after a while of chasing her, we're like, we're struggling to hold on to. And my husband and I are learning to tap in and out so that one of us is always in a calm place. Um, but I guess, yeah, but I guess um, my question is really like, 
is any, does anything actually work once they reach that place? Or does it just going to take time to deescalate for her? It takes a couple hours. Usually she's going to come to her senses. Um, but one, how do I keep her safe while that's happening? Um, and two, is that just the way it is? Like when she gets to red, there's no real coming back. She won't breathe. She won't take her eyes. Like all the things that work when she's at yellow to keep from going to red, she refuses right. in red. So in DBT, we have a concept of emotion mind and reasonable mind. Mm -hmm. And the ideal is, is wise mind and integration of both. Yeah. So oftentimes what happens is when we're in emotion mind, we are red hot. We literally are. And there is some biology around this that what happens when our emotions escalate in the primitive part of the brain, it really shuts off the higher order cognitive processes and the processing of emotions in that area. And a teenager's brain isn't finished to begin with. So you're dealing with all kinds of deficits. So you're very wise to have identified, okay, where does the yellow zone, you know, where is that? And that's our place for intervention. And sometimes even like what Watt said, sometimes there's nothing can be said or done, right? You just have to let that episode play itself out. That's what we call them episodes. That's funny. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was helpful, but I can validate that that is a common experience. And if she is, and you may want to consider again, whether she is really fully weight restored, right? Maybe she needs a little more. Maybe that will help with some of the regulation. And then maybe she needs some DBT after, right? Thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands up. Um, I'll ask a quick question, um, which is just, um, why aren't DBT skills offered to parents on a regular basis? I mean, that's, you know, kind of a, a, I don't know, it's not a question that I expect you to answer, but it's kind of a more of a rhetorical question of the, you know, we're all in situations where we need to deescalate, we need to regulate our emotions, um, and we need to regulate, you know, or try to regulate the emotions of another person. And um, it just seems like, you know, such a shame to me um, as a parent that we're not offered these skills as part of, you know, the psychoeducation that we get when our child has an eating disorder. I would go one better. I would think that we need to start integrating teaching children DBT in schools. <laughs> teaching these skills because this is you know um socio-emotional learning right and, and there are always going to be things in life that are going to be dysregulating and there, there are going to be crises at different times um and, and so with an eating disorder right we're talking about even i mean think about how few clinicians actually are certified in fbt and who do that around the world right and and similarly i think maybe dbt is a little bit more widely known and, and practiced but I don't think there's enough of that overlap, right? I, my mentor in all this was, is, was Lucine Wisniewski and her work was at the forefront of this. And um, I, I think some of her stuff has been published in a lot of DBT treatment um, publications, maybe not in enough ED treatment publications, um, and, and I think that not enough people, just like not enough clinicians are trained in FBT, not enough clinicians are trained in real DBT versus a cursory overview of skills. So I think these are systemic questions. Um, they are. Um, a more practical question is, um, if you're doing FBT, how do you know um, whether it's beneficial to bring in DBT? Meaning, what, what would you see in FBT that would lead you to think that you needed, you know, an adjunct of DBT, that it would be helpful, um, you know, that it would make the situation better? Well, I can't imagine where it wouldn't be helpful, quite frankly, but I'm biased. Um, but if you're talking about bringing in other therapists, that's where I'd be careful. Right, because I think that it has to be someone who understands FBT and is willing to hold the line. I have collaborators that I've worked with that I have shared physical office space with and shared families with where somebody might be doing um, family DBT while I'm doing FBT. And they know not to touch the eating disorder as a target behavior for the adolescent. 
right? So they don't mess the FBT, but FBT and DBT share certain features that are really important, right? We're very non-judgmental. We take a very matter of fact kind of um, scientific approach, right? Biologically based approach, validating approach. Um, so I think they can integrate very nicely, um, and, but I don't think you can ever go wrong by using the principles if you know them well. Okay, yay, I see another hand. Um, I, I hope I'm pronouncing Brigitte right. Maybe it's not Brigitte. Bridget. <laughs> if it's Bridget. No, it's Brid uh, Brigitte. It's Bridget okay. Brigitte. <laughs> I'll okay. go with anything. So um, my husband and I, we have a, well, she's 19 now, your old daughter with ARFID. And we've been, sorry, um, trying to get her back online and everything that you've been saying to cut the chain and everything. Sorry, emotional. It's okay, of course. Still a little bit new to us. Um, she had it when she was 12 and it was a lot easier back back then when she's 12 <laughs> yep. but how, how do we deal with this now that she's in her mindset an adult but not thinking clearly as an adult obviously and she still has some weight to be gained how do we um I guess cut that chain or get her along in, in an adult situation yeah so one of the things that I said early on was that this is about what we can do to apply for ourselves, right? To use, to learn, to de-escalate our own emotions, our own fears, our own anger, and then model a kind of wise mind discussion and approach. And in practice then, I would also ask parents to set limits, right? Like Maud said, everything else stops. Meal comes first. And I think at 19, I, J.D. Olette, who I adore, a feast mom, right, has this quote that I've used. 18 ain't nothing but a two-digit number. Yeah. <laughs> right? A, the relationship is where your authority comes from. And so I, I have daughters in their 20s. And I'm still the authority. It's the relationship that we use. And we ground ourselves, we get mindful about that and about where our limits lie, about what we can cope with, right? So that's, in this context, that's about as much as I can say to keep it relevant to this discussion. Right, okay. Um, well, Thank we're you. almost at the end of our time. Um, so I would like to say again, thank you. Um, to Abby and to Maude and to everyone who asked questions um, because exposing our vulnerabilities, um, you know, when you're chatting and nobody's seeing you and no one's hearing you, um, it's a lot easier to, you know, hide our vulnerabilities, but being able to actually have this format, which I loved. Um, I love seeing your faces. I love hearing your voices. Um, I think it's a much better way to do things. So I think from here on in, maybe we'll try this again if it's okay with everyone else. Um, but thank you, really, thank you so much. This was extremely informative and useful and helpful um, and a really important topic that we don't like to talk about because it's uncomfortable and it's unpleasant and it's scary. But the bottom line is that there are parents out there who need to hear it. So thank you for bringing it to us today. Um, I would just like to um, let everyone know that, you know, this webinar and all of our programs are funded by our own community. So if you have the opportunity and you'd like to donate to FEAST, um, you can go to this link and you can do so. And we have our next webinar um, is partnering with primary care, building a team to beat your child's eating disorder. It's going to be a great webinar. Um, unfortunately, hold on a second, can't see the date. Okay, Wednesday, May 11th um, at 1 p.m. EST. 
So we really hope, put it on your calendar. We really hope that you'll join us for next month. Um, and I think that's all we have for today. Thank you again, everyone, for attending. And we'll see you next month. Bye. Thank you.